Welcome everybody who's making their way into the webinar session here. I see some familiar faces and familiar names, so that's great. Um, we'll take just a couple minutes here to give any remaining folks time to get into the Zoom room here. And um, while we're getting started, I'll just introduce myself. So my name is Jacob Grace. I'm a communication specialist with the Savannah Institute. And the Savannah Institute is a nonprofit organization laying the groundwork for widespread agroforestry in the Midwest. So a lot of the work we do is in Southern Wisconsin and Northern and Central Illinois, um, but we do try to work um, within the area that was historically the Oak Savannah biome. So um, that kind of stretches all across the upper Midwest and as we'll hear today, stretches all the way over to Ohio a little bit. So. Um, we're glad to have you all joining today for the final webinar in our Partnering for Agroforestry series. So this is a series that's been funded by the um, National Agroforestry Center, uh, which is based in Nebraska, working to promote and support agroforestry throughout the United States. Um, and this particular series has been focused on different types of partnerships and especially uh, types of financial partnerships that can make agroforestry possible. As many of us know, it can be a very big upfront investment and not a lot of immediate payoff. So uh, partnerships are pretty key to that. Um, and we're very pleased to be joined today uh, by Chris Smith and Badger Johnson who will be speaking to us about the Southern Ohio Chestnut Company. And um, they're going to introduce themselves and say a lot more about that, but I can just say that the Southern Ohio Chestnut Company is a multi-farm business uh, co-founded by Chris and Badger, uh, operating on multiple properties in Southern Ohio uh, with a focus on Chinese chestnut varieties. Um, the company currently manages, among other properties, manages 25 acres um, through a long-term 75-year lease with Woodcock Nature Preserve. Um, and they're also uh, getting into pairing their chestnut trees with paw paw trees. So um, we'll have a lot to talk about here. I think uh, Chris and Badger are gonna talk for the first 20 or 30 minutes, and then we're gonna have lots of time in the second half for questions. So I'll be keeping an eye on the chat. Um, if you have questions you'd like to ask, feel free to uh, drop them in the chat, or if it it seems like a good moment. There aren't too many of us yet, so you could probably even unmute yourself and, and jump in if it, um, if it seems like the right moment to ask a question. So um, I'll, I'll keep admitting people as they arrive here. And with that, I'll go ahead and turn things over to Chris and Badger. Well, thank you, Jacob. Um, yeah, we'll use some slides to, to kind of guide us a little bit. And Badger and I will just do our best to kind of bat off of each other. So let me get those slides up. Great. Uh, well, yeah, so that was a great intro um, to some of what we're doing. Welcome all. Glad to see some familiar faces in the room and some names that I recognize. But yeah, like Jacob said, uh, post questions and um, we could even kind of interrupt some of this time and poke in some other questions as we're going through this. But we've got a couple uh, visuals here just to, to help frame some of the work. Um, but yeah, so we're kind of focusing our time here thinking about partnerships and maybe less on the technical aspects of some of the agroforestry and agricultural practices we're engaged in. We'll talk about some of that, but we're trying to, to veer toward just what actually makes it work. And really partnerships is what makes the thing work. Um, Badger and I both had a lot of experiences working for other people, um, building our skill sets, growing uh, our own abilities over period of 10, 15 years. And we saw lots of partnerships fall apart. And really the social systems in this work is, is what makes it happen. It's what uh, survives or kills a project or an effort. So I'm really grateful for the partners that we do have and our partnership. Um, yeah. Uh, so like, like Jacob said, Southern Ohio Chestnut Company, we're focusing on Chinese chestnuts, but really growing a whole lot of other things. And we'll talk about the pawpaw or the garlic, elderberry, just other fun things we're adding to this farm. Uh, but the first farm that we planted was in 2020, and we did that with a community partner day. Uh, so just want to keep posting along. Um, uh, 
so early on, I, I actually want to turn it over to Badger to talk a little bit about um, what we're growing, why, where we are in the Midwest, and then a little bit about our initial story meeting up in Kazakhstan. Great. All right, everyone, can you hear me? Um, looks like Chris yeah. can hear me. So, yep, we can hear you. Uh, Chris and I, we uh, have been doing, you know, backyard food forests and that kind of thing for a decade or more. And we started to feel that we wanted to do something bigger um, and something that where it could look like what we would do when we were retired. So we were casting around and um, uh, Chinese chestnut seemed to be the thing uh, that people were making money at. Um, definitely some bottlenecks to work through in terms of supply chains and whatnot, but seemed to be a good living there. So um, we were also motivated by feeding people and not just making money. Um, and, you know, we, we, Southeast Ohio is in Appalachia and, um, historically there have been chestnuts in our part of the world um and depending on which you know archaeologist and anthropologist you believe there were a lot of chestnuts in our part of the world um and uh, you know game species were more abundant due to the masting nuts and uh, nutrient cycling across the whole continent was happening in a better way and of course no more American chestnuts, at least for now. So Chinese is a good substitute, especially because of the markets. So when we thought about what's a tree crop for central Appalachia, the Chinese chestnut made sense. Next slide, please. Um, thinking about the cultural piece of it too, uh, you know, local control, uh, people having control over their um, food supply, um, we were inspired by uh, stories of people living on chestnuts in mountainous areas across the, uh, the world. And the story of Corsica, uh, where there's not a lot of uh, tillable ground, it's not flat, it's very mountainous. Um, and people living on making bread with chestnuts and then uh, retreating into the forest during you know, periods of invasion by colonial powers and falling back on the chestnuts. Uh, that, that was sort of an appealing story. And it's one that we heard in uh, multiple places around the world, sort of a pattern that we were plugged into. Um, next slide, I guess. Uh, Chris and I had heard about one such example in Central Asia, um, same sort of bioregion as where apples are from. And we were looking at uh, two very extensive and ancient temperate uh, agroforestry systems. One is this wild apple forest in Kazakhstan, which we visited. And uh, one was a walnut fruit forest. Um, this is the one in Kazakhstan. Uh, this is a national park. The person pictured there sitting next to a sort of old growth apricot tree. Um, I don't know if any of you can tell what those plants are underneath them, but fascinatingly, it was mostly uh, food and medicine plants that any Westerner um, with a background in herbalism or, you know, perennial crops would, would recognize, you know, there's elecampane, nettle, mint, oregano, tansy, hops, there's cannabis, licorice. It was, it was fascinating because it looks pretty wild. And uh, nobody had been tending it for a long time, as far as we could tell, but it was super abundant and very uh, sort of anthropocentric. Uh, next slide, please. Here we are in the, uh, the walnut forest, which is much more highly managed. And it's managed as a silvopasture, um, 60,000 acre silvopasture that uh, you know, certainly predates the Soviet Union. Uh, the story that the people there have about its origin was that 
this sort of demigod or hero named Arslan Bob, who's a disciple of the prophet Muhammad, uh, came to the valley, converted the Zoroastrians to Islam, and uh, attempted to rebuild the Garden of Eden. It's a very touching legend. And uh, yeah, I mean, a thousand years later, there's still 20,000 people living here in a population center where everything around it is desert. And so it's, um, these, this is an artificial forest uh, that has supported people all that time. Um, and we, we, uh, we hiked up to the top of the valley and we looked out over this, you know, so it's bigger than the national forest next to where I am or the ranger district anyway. Uh, it's like, we need to think bigger than the backyard food forest. You know, we could make a difference here to people now and you know maybe working together in partnerships for agroforestry will make a difference for people a thousand years in the future next slide please i saw a pickup um so yeah when we were there in kyrgyzstan in arzambab kyrgyzstan a thing that we were noticing is yeah it, it's sixty thousand acres of walnut um and it's managed by three different villages and they have created an ecosystem a social ecosystem to work together to manage this. There are times in the harvest where one village can't do anything, like they can't help, they, they, they can't supply the labor, and another group kind of picks up more of the work, but they still share in some of the profits. Uh, so it's quite a complex social system that keeps these trees alive. Um, so all of those things, like all the things that we were learning in our own practice and work and design work, uh, the things that this land, where we are here in Southern Ohio, wants to be kind of what the land itself is is telling us it wants to be. And then these other um, larger stable sets of uh, peaceful interactions between plant communities and, and human communities. Uh, we're all kind of building up towards something. Uh, and then we really had to look around to uh, the, the giants that we stand on the shoulders of in our region and see who is doing stuff, uh, who is actually planting perennial food crops growing them well and growing them usually in partnerships and cooperatives. And there's way more on this list than could possibly fit here, but just a couple we put on. So in, in, in Ohio, um, Route 9 Co-op, uh, Greg Miller and, um, oh gosh, I always mix up, uh, Bill's. Um, uh, Dofer, yeah. Dofer. Um, and many others are part of the co-op that's just in Northern Ohio. Um, I'm getting that backwards. I always mix up the B. There's somebody yeah. else up there. Bob Staley, that's it. Yeah, yeah. I, I do that too. I'm, I'm, I'm stuck on the bees. Uh, but actually, I got to visit Bob, uh, Bill Stouffer out in Missouri and pick up Scion Wood. So like, it's such a well-connected network. It's, it's um, people who are uh, maybe, maybe nearing retiring age, uh, and they are just so incredibly generous with their knowledge, which, with their patience. <laughs> How many times we visited Greg and filled out notebook after notebook of questions in 2019 when we were designing the farm. Uh, Redfern Farm, Tom Wall and Kathy Dice. Uh, we bought the seed nuts for the trees that we planted in our first orchard from Hark that Tom had extra of. So we bought them from Tom, Greg grew them out and then we planted them in Southern Ohio. So it is some kind of supply chain um, that usually works by phone calls. And I just really appreciate that. Uh, but then also even Savannah Institute and then uh, just like documents that exist that, that people, researchers spend time crafting and sometimes they just get put on a shelf. And these were the lifeblood of early design projects. Uh, and it's a real different challenge putting it you know, in the ground versus what you read in a document about what things are gonna cost and what production is. But it was enough back of the napkin calculations that gave us confidence in the work that we were doing. Uh, so some other partners that we wanted to talk about, especially when we planted this first farm, is we worked with NRCS through their EQIP program. If people aren't familiar with that, it's a cost share reimbursement program. And then also CRP, Conservation Reserve Program, is another kind of program that we've learned how to use for um, chestnut or other agroforestry projects. And I just want to wedge this in here because it, it, take, it takes time to kind of crack some government systems. <laughs> And uh, what we've learned even working with some of our local Ohio State Extension agents is um, if you're talking with your local NRCS rep and they say what you're trying to do is crazy and they don't, they don't cover it, uh, growing food on trees for people, that's crazy. We only grow 
uh, food on trees for deer. Um, oftentimes it is covered or it is in their large book of, of practices, but just that one specific agent maybe hasn't had experience with it. So they aren't too familiar. And what you could do is go back to um, a state rep or someone who's doing fruit and nut growing at the state level um, to just get another advocate on your team to help coach and then kind of work with a local NRCS rep to say like, actually there is funding for irrigation. There is funding for um, tree tubes and protection. There is funding for the trees. We didn't know any of that at the time. And we're really grateful that at least we were able to finagle some kind of cost share for some of the trees. Um, so, you know, even working with government partners is usually like, like pointing them against each other sometimes, or even just an NRCS rep that you know and have worked with, like helping them help over the next county. Um, so the main, the core partnership that we, we focus on is that uh, the Woodcock Nature Preserve. Like Jacob said, that's where our first farm is. Uh, the preserve is about 100 acres. Um, they, uh, we, engage, we help them, and it, it's a really great partnership where we are also working with them on leading um, uh, prairie burns in the, the area to uh, prescribe fires for managing about a 30 acre prairie where we have some American chestnuts planted. There's a forest where we're doing understory medicinal um, uh, plant development. There's a 5k trail that we've helped build with the preserve. Uh, there's two properties on the prop, uh, two houses on the property, and then us, this 25 acre agroforestry farm. So I think with all of those things, what we're seeing with this nature preserve, which is more just kind of banked as a preserve, um, but kind of like nominally cared for because it's a smaller nonprofit. It doesn't have, you know, the capacity to just write grants. It's just keeping the land in a, in a kind of con conservation practice. Uh, but adding other partners to that land, I think is really seeing a lot more activity for it. Um, Brad, do you wanna pick up with some of the early days of building the farm? Sure, yes, absolutely. Um, I love that we are getting paid to get up on our soapbox here. There's a few important, important things that I wanna hit home for people. Uh, one is soil testing. Uh, you know, we, we use, um, just a standard soil test, but also uh, you know particle size test or texture test uh, to get a sense for where on the soil triangle, where in terms of pH, where your macros and micros are they uh, somewhere that would be good for growing apples? You know, because there's not really a recommended set of uh, nutrients for chestnuts yet, but they have that for pecans and they have that for apples. Um, so. Besides that, uh, we used a soil penetrometer, which is a fancy name for a metal rod that you stick in the ground and see how much resistance it yields at different heights. And there was a bit of a hard pan at 18 inches. Um, and we decided to uh, do a subsoil rip down to 22 inches, 24 inches, something like that to at least try and break up that hard pan. Um, something else that we did that was controversial, uh, not necessarily in the chestnut community at large, but in the local agricultural community in Southeast Ohio is we irrigated. Um, and we used very young trees um, and we planted after they leafed out and they basically all survived the first year. So um, <laughs> the NRCS agent walked on site to look at our trees after they had survived. And there's the forestry mulcher uh, turning all the invasive shrubs into mulch, which I loved um, feeding the soil. But uh, he walks on site and he says, wow, all these trees are alive. I guess I lost the bet. I said, well, what bet, what bet did you take against our trees? And they're like, well, back at the, Back at the office, we had a betting pool going that all your trees were going to be dead because you planted in June, July. And I said, that's the last time you'll ever bet, bet against the Southern Ohio Chestnut Company. But anyway, um, the forestry mulcher was great. Uh, e that was reimbursed to us um, through Equip. Uh, we did have to spray the, uh, the stumps with herbicide but um, 
you know, you could have just done the herbicide, but then you'd still have the skeleton of all these shrubs all over the place. And that wouldn't have allowed us to plant the trees. Here's the subsoiler. Uh, you need at least like a 70 horsepower tractor to drag this thing through the ground. Um, oh, there's another very important partnership to discuss, Chris, is we have somebody who owns all the equipment right down the street and we pay them instead of investing in all the equipment up front. Um, yeah, Chris McLaughlin was a key partnership. And, you know, if there's farms around, there's often people who have equipment. And uh, I'm sure once one day we'll want our own tractor, especially if we find a chestnut harvester that we like. But um, yeah, real, they, uh, real core part of our operating procedures is keeping as lean as possible. Uh, we are leasing this land in a 75 year lease with option to renew. So this these trees will grow older than we will. Um, but without the ability to like kind of stay lean in these first 10 years, like you said, sometimes starting these kind of projects, there's not a lot of return for the first many years. So we don't live on this farm. We don't, um, we're sort of weekend warriors to the farm. Badger's quite close and I'm in Cincinnati. So on the other side of the state. Um, so yeah, without the kind of local infrastructure of someone to do a once a year mowing to keep, uh, the woodies down and to do some of the tractor work. Now we don't have to buy a tractor, at least not until maybe there are some profits that we can use to buy the tractor. It's a real core strategy for us. Yeah, very bootstrappy. And we use our own savings to invest in this first farm. Um, so keeping the cost down and keeping our management inputs down. You know, people are like, oh, you can just bucket water out the first year, right? That'll be fine. And I was like, no, I'm not bucketing water onto 20 acres of chestnut trees. You know, um, that just seems like insanity to me. Yeah. Yeah. Using resources for lever points for the right effect. Um, and though chestnuts are a drought tolerant crop, um, having that bit of infrastructure, water in the Midwest is very cheap. And when you're using it, very specifically on drip irrigation at the point of the trees. Now we have that for the pawpaws that we just planted. We basically interplanted all of the pawpaw with every chestnut. So there'll be about a thousand pawpaw by the time we're done. And again, that's because we saw Tom Wall and Kathy Dice doing that up at Redfern Farm in Iowa. So like without those people who've already kind of pioneered some of these things and, and shown that these systems work, uh, we, would, we would have much more, uh, uh, we'd be worried. Um, but we're a lot more confident and also with our own skill and ability. Um, another thing that was really core to what we did is um, we organized planting days. So Badger and I kind of worked really hard for five weeks in preparing this land that had been kind of maligned. There was about six acres of invasives, just autumn olive everywhere. Um, and so, you know, getting that up, getting the irrigation up. Uh, I had never planned 25 acres of irrigation before in my life. <laughs> I've done some plumbing in a house, but you know, like th these are new skills we were working. So we basically were sprinting to prep for a community planting day at the end of June, 2020. Um, and we had about 40, 50 people come out and, and help us put trees in the ground. And I said this in the middle of the event, cause we, we took time in the middle of the day, we fed people, we had a, we had music in the evening. So instead of us spending resources necessarily on um, staff or uh, contractors, workers who are putting these trees in, we chose to invest in the enjoyment of the experience. And I think everybody who is there, we got feedback from so many friends are like, I'm glad I'm here planting these trees with you. I've done other community plantings. I'm confident that these trees will live. Uh, you do some food forest stuff, you do some permaculture projects and um, you do it with friends, but then to actually know that what you're doing is making a difference and that these trees will live and become food for people is a really different feeling for people. Um, so that's where we chose to deploy our resources in, in organizing this group of people. And one of the things that I noticed after we train people in the morning is systems like that kind of have their own way of forming their own intelligence. When you get 50 people together, give them some directives. Sometimes you have to correct course. We had a couple of people uh, kind of break away and not listen as well. Uh, but at the end of the day, it was one of the more intelligent organisms I'd ever been a part of. Um, so the, the multiplicity of partnerships that happened in that moment, I think encouraged some people who were there to plant their own thing. That's what we wanted to see. 
Uh, and then maybe people who are never going to plant large orchards, just give them the experience. Um, yeah, and we continue to do that, like because this is cultural work at the end of the day, trying to reestablish a culture of uh, trees as food, whether it be with pawpaw or chestnut or other um, tree food crops. You know, we used to have competitions in this country a hundred years ago, celebrating trees that were magnificent in delivering food to people. And we've lost a lot of that tradition. So a lot of what we're doing is a planting party in the spring and then a harvest party in the fall. And we right now do the harvest party with Route 9 Co-op. And so we just like pull people from all these cities and get them out to Carrollton, Ohio in Eastern Ohio. Uh, you wanna talk about Sugarbush? Uh, yes, I'd love to. Um, so like we said, we're in a an agricultural uh, district at, at uh, Southern Ohio Chestnut Company's first orchard and uh, Rural Action, which is a nonprofit that I'm affiliated with. Uh, they work with um, some people who own land right down the street uh, who were looking for things to do. They were finding that their hay business was not as profitable as they wanted it to be, it was sucking up a lot of time. And um, they had a, you know, a high and dry ridge site that had just been clear cut of uh, white pine um, for paper pulp. And uh, as you may or may not know, you know, white pine has sort of an acidifying influence on the soil. Um, and uh, we had these folks out to see our orchard and they said, we'd really be pretty interested in this. Um, and so we, we took that idea and ran with it. Basically they paid us to design and install their orchard. And then they're also, they have a contract with us to maintain it. So um, that's our second orchard, uh, very different than planting in an old field. Uh, so we had the forestry mulchers back in, we had the stump grinder come in as well. And basically there was like four inches of mulch over, it's not completely homogeneous, but um, uh, homogeneous, but it was a heavily mulched site. So we didn't even plant anything the first, uh, in terms of ground cover, uh, we basically, cause basically the whole 11 acres was mulched. Um, and once again, we uh, used seedling trees from uh, superior mothers. And this time we hired a group of uh, five of our friends to join us to uh, plant these trees. And we paid them, um, they said yes before they ha heard how much we were gonna pay them. And it's just a couple of years ago, we paid them $20 an hour. And some of them were like, wow, we've never made $20 an hour for farm work, this is great. And so just trying to, uh, oh, we also like sort of put them up in our house and it was like a miniature kind of intensive uh, festival atmosphere. We made music in the evening, we made food together. Um, and uh, it, was, it was very good. Um, uh, one thing I'll, I'll throw in real yeah. quick, uh, another fun partnership in here is that land is a bit of a land lap. There's lots of other um, groups interacting there, trying different things. Uh, Badger could talk way more about that. Um, we, we might not have time to go into all the, um, the, the fun technical details of the different projects going on there. But on this chestnut planting for irrigation, we chose to pump from a pond. And uh, Badger and I work with another guy, um, Dan Divelbis, who built a solar pump house and we're pumping um, and cleaning and sometimes adding some, some acidifying agents to water that's going out to the fields. So it's, a, it's an off-grid pump house using the assets that are already there. It was a, for us, like the first kind of big subcontracting thing we did and like doing the, the kind of two houses of design work and coordinating install was, was a real challenge, but um, really rewarding. Right, it's, it's a thing of beauty. Um, and pe when people finally realize what that shed is, which looks like it's been always been there because it's made with 
wood from a torn down barn. Um, <laughs> they're like, wow, this is sort of solar punk. This is sort of future, <laughs> futuristic. Anyway. Yeah, so this is just a bit of summary. Uh, and first off, this photo is what a uh, photo that we took with this like double rainbow in the background after our first planting day. It's just ridiculous. Like we're out there with 50 people. It's end of June, it's hot, it's sweaty. And this rain comes down. We get the last of the chestnuts in that we want to. And then this like rainbow appears. It's just <laughs> very idealistic. Um, but yeah, what we've got going there as far as agroforestry on this first farm site is about a thousand culinary chestnuts. Uh, we've got about 800 pawpaw planted. We'll get the rest of it in next year. Uh, we're doing black locusts for fence posts. We've got another cooperative, Badger, myself, and two other farmers who are cooperating on a, scaling out a garlic uh, alley crop between the chestnuts. Uh, we've put about a quarter acre of elderberry in. We had another farmer there growing cotton as a medicinal root. Um, and we would love to get some, some animals there at some point. So I, I think once this gets up and running and once the chestnuts start producing, it's gonna look like um, all of those systems that for us, we read about and now we're actually getting to live it. Uh, and then of course, doing a few more um, over at Sugarbush, uh, we planted some timber chestnuts, some more upright growth form Chinese chestnuts. Um, and yeah, what, what's next for us is we're working on two new leases with farms that we'll plant out next year. Uh, those are still in like contract working out negotiation kind of way, um, but two different sites, uh, one that's about 20 minutes from our first farm and the other that's about an hour between both of us. So it's kind of in the middle of Southern Ohio. Uh, the goal is expanding the garlic kind of as some of our cash flow, because really right now we cash flow a lot of it with our own personal finances or some design work or other things like that. Uh, we've did a lot of field grafting of chestnuts and we'll do a lot more <laughs> over the over the coming years. And we're hoping to explore more partnerships with people who want this work done, but as well figuring out other financing mechanisms because if we're trying and maybe we'll make it there before we're gone, uh, before we're dust, um, we would love to get 640 acres of Chinese chestnut planted in Southern Ohio. Yes. I noticed that we have a question here. I'll read it for the group. When you say black locust for fence posts, do you mean to harvest and use as fence posts or use using as living fence posts? Also would love to hear about lessons learned with tree tubes, preferred type, source, height. You wanna take this one, Chris? Sure. Yeah, there's kind of um, maybe our problem as maybe many of you's problems is here's what's possible. Let's do a test, which is not really a test. It's not really an experiment and try all of what's possible. Um, so with black locusts as fence posts, I think three things are possible. And that is um, growing them out and harvesting them, uh, growing them out as coppice and then harvesting those. Um, and then yeah, growing them as living fence posts. So we're, we're trying to kind of do all of them. Um, we haven't yet started on the living fence post thing, but I really do like that idea. Badger is a larger proponent of it. Um, I think on our site, we'll have to do some extra work to really make that happen. But yeah, primarily this is growing black locusts out as harvestable timber close to where we would harvest it. And the idea is for deer fencing. So, I mean, with a Chinese chestnut orchard, if you're planning on um, really having a commercial crop in 10 years, 10 years is about what you've got for growing your own deer fence. Um, what was the other one? There was another question. Sourcing of tubes. Yeah, so we, we used all Plantra tree tubes, the whole kit. Um, and that was uh, in partnership with Tom Wall. Um, Tom has an agreement with Plantra of ordering, basically if you order more than 500, then it's a pretty attractive price. Um, it's one of these things that as we did our research in 2019 and we visited other sites, we saw people who had different tubes, different protection, and they always kind of half worked. And like we said, um, our, our plan was to be lean, but that doesn't mean cheap. So we didn't mind at all going with Plantra, which is a more expensive tube bought in bulk. So it lowered the price, but bulletproof, it, they work great. Uh, though something that we did learn that we weren't expecting is in July um, uh, of the first year, uh, Japanese beetle is out. 
and I've worked in tree plantings for years before, and it was never a huge concern, Japanese beetle, because, you know, they eat some leaves, it's fine. Uh, it was never like massive pressure. But basically, we trapped these little baby trees inside a tube uh, with no way for birds or other predators to get in. So we trapped them with these like tiny tigers who were just shredding the leaves. Um, so we did use uh, systemic pesticide on the trees um, to protect in these first couple of years. Um, but yeah, the, after we saw like 50 trees basically defoliated, it was like, okay, we gotta, we gotta watch out for this. Great, next question is, could you share the details of which NRCS EQIP program funded the chestnut tree planting and any resources to share on that? I can take that. Um, you know, this is, your NRCS agent is like either in your county or in two or three counties, but there's a home office and, you know, they have a desk there. Uh, sometimes they'll work from home, but they're people that you need to go in and visit because they are going to, unless you are a technical service provider yourself, um, they are the one who's going to write your conservation activity plan or whatever the heck that acronym is now. They just changed it this year. But they're going to basically put together a mini grant, submit it to a state pool of funds, and here's where the shell game begins. And then if they awarded it, they say, okay, you know, this is how much money we'll give you. You have to spend the money, do the thing, and then we'll pay you back at this agreed upon rate. There's about seven rounds of paperwork that we had to sign. Um, and we had to be a squeaky wheel to make sure we were hitting those deadlines, um, which was a real pain. Um, uh, there's a few times when we thought we'd signed the final round, round of paperwork and we hadn't, uh, even after the you know, we've been awarded the funds, but, um, you know, we didn't try and make the, uh, bureaucrat that we're working with the bad guy. Cause he's not, uh, he's a friend, um, and just kept on pushing. And, uh, basically we, we got him sold on the idea and, uh, he said, look, you know, the, the forester that works on our team, he works for the Division of Forestry, he's not going to be about Chinese chestnuts because all he cares about is timber because that's what he learned about in school. Uh, so we're, and the tree planting budget this year is quite competitive. Like, I don't know if you're going to get the money allocated to you if you we apply to that pot of money within USDA. So we're going to apply to the wildlife pot of money uh, for tree planting, which um, we didn't even spend all of last year, and we got it. Um, so on paper, the those trees were for wildlife, um, which to be fair, they're in Phagaceae. There's lots of things that eat the leaves and eat the nuts, and we don't have a fence up yet. So um, uh, certainly going to be good for birds. So I don't feel like that's uh, too far from being the, the truth. Um, but yeah, uh, basically, depending on the state, you may or may not have, you know, alley cropping permissible, and you certainly might not have a local, um, agent who understands it or people above them who support agroforestry. So that's why you kind of stealth it with just, uh, um, brush management for the invasive control um, tree shrub planting site and site preparation for tree shrub planting are like three different practices that we did. We also got money for conservation cover, you know, planting more seeds of different species that we wanted. I hope that answers your questions. You can, we can circle back around and drill into more details if you have them. Um, yeah, I see another question here. Um, <clears throat> one that I think I can answer quickly and then one about irrigation. So the first one, just asking about uh, farm layout, row spacing, inline spacing, all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, yeah, so what, what we're doing is um, a 40 by 20. So um, 20 foot in row and then 40 foot between rows for the chestnuts. Um, and then now what we've done is placed a pawpaw between every chestnut in row. So that creates a 40 by 10 grid. Um, it's a, it, 
we didn't realize when we first planted it, but uh, just marking the rows essentially with the subsoiler is kind of what happened. Um, so instead of drawing a gigantic string out or something like that, or doing um, like GPS coordinated robo painting and stuff is we basically uh, ripped 40 foot rows and then people planted things in that. Um, yeah, so stocking density like 50 trees an acre is kind of what that looks like for chestnuts. Um, and then subsequently 50 trees an acre for the pawpaw. Uh, there's a bit in here about irrigation. Uh, really great question all around. So uh, I got very annoyed talking with a couple of irrigation reps who are selling me their products um, because they fundamentally didn't understand what we are trying to do with drip irrigation. And they kept quoting me these numbers about, well, like an inch of rain is this many gallons on a piece of land. And it's like, we're not trying to irrigate all the land. There's 50 trees. We're irrigating 50 trees on an acre. So your numbers are irrelevant. Um, but I will say when we put together the plan for the farm in 2019, we probably came up with 19 different plans for 19 different farms on the same piece of land. There's so many variables in all this. We, we, we thought through 30 by 30 grid for plant spacing. Uh, we tried three different water sources for our irrigation before we came up with what we have now. Um, so what we have is city water. We tapped into one of the house lines and then just um, work with that, whoever's living in the house to water at night or do something so it doesn't change the water pressure too much, but pretty affordable source of water. Water in the Midwest is cheap um, and it's pressurized, which is a huge value to us. Uh, there's three fields that we irrigate to, one that's about 470 trees. So that field, when the trees get more mature, will split up into two um, uh, zones, you could say. Um, it's not on a schedule. Uh, right now, the manual controls work. We have some work to do to finish with the Wi-Fi control. Um, but when this thing is up and running, finally, it should work. Uh, we, we've built the irrigation brain, the valve station to work with Wi-Fi controls. So this should be something that we will operate from our phones. And the idea is you, you don't like chestnuts don't like wet feet. Uh, most fruit trees don't. Um, uh, and they are a drought tolerant crop, but like basically in any one week of drought, one week without rain will irrigate. Um, and right now it's drip irrigation near the base of the tree. Uh, we really thought it was worth it when we looked at some of the numbers from Hark and other places who are irrigating their chestnuts. And a chestnut itself is mostly water. Uh, I think all the money and time and frustration that we've put into fixing lines and all that stuff, uh, any one year of actual drought in our area will be worth all of it, just in terms of pounds. I want to jump on that, Chris, because people people not might not be sold on this, and they might also be thinking about California almonds and you know the rivers drying up out west, and that's just the devil which I, you know, it is the devil, but um, uh, we are not in California. We get plenty of water. Our aquifers are not imperiled. Um, and, you know, we, we saved probably in, in 2020, 2022, we probably saved $3, uh, $4 by planting small trees that had germinated that spring. And we could not have done that if we were not irrigating. What we saved paid for the irrigation system in year one by the saving on the tree size that we planted. Nobody had ever done that as far as we'd seen, but it worked great. And um, uh, it is, it's just wonderful <laughs> to know that uh, our trees are going to, um, be able to forage for nutrients, uh, but not have to forage for water uh, too badly. You know, and we, you know, we, there was still probably only 11 weeks when we ever turned it on, maybe 10 a year. Um, and that's when the, you know, that's when the, the rains don't come. But if the rains do come, you don't have to turn the water on that week, you know? And so, uh, and in terms of yields, you know, just look at the horticulture and agroforestry research centers. They just, you know, Mizzou just re-released their chestnut growing guide. They have good information. 
you know, you're going to be limited by the quality of your soil, you know, the site index for uh, northern red oak. Um, uh, you know, if it's, if it's, if it's a 60 instead of an 80, uh, you're not going to grow as good a trees or get as good a yields, but um, if the soil's good and you check the soil before you ever started a commercial chestnut planting there, right? Uh, then it's just, are you going to get enough water? And that can double the yields in a drought a year. That's, that's what was found. And that's what we mean by standing on the shoulders of giants. We're not making this stuff up. We're not speculating about it. It's stuff that's been derived by other people with American tax dollars. <laughs> so let's, uh, we, I mean, you can just, you can trust it or you can not trust it, but I basically trust it. Um, there was a question here about um, uh, managing the herb layer near the trees. Bad, you want to take that? Yeah, totally. Um, so uh, as organic as we would like to be, our hands are tied by weevil control later down the line. And until somebody comes up with organic weevil control, we cannot be a certified organic operation. So we decided to spray herbicide around the base of the trees. Um, we started out with glyphosate. And uh, this year we are using, oh uh, gosh, what is it? It's a grass specific herbicide. Um, they always have freaking goofy names, but uh, fusillade, that's it. It's what people use on clover, you know, deer plots, uh, food plots um, to kill uh, grass that would take over the clover. But uh, we also, you know, have some oust that we've used and just trying to, uh, just trying to do that in the beginning. You know, if we could go back and do it again, maybe we would buy the weed mats, the planter cells. Um, if this was going to be an even, even lower maintenance system and we weren't going to irrigate, we would definitely, I think, get the weed mats just so uh, we didn't have to, you know, we, we weren't playing with fire, you know, because we don't want to uh, starve the little trees of water. Yeah, I'll add one more thing. Long term, we'd like to get into a practice of cutting some of the alleys um, and then hay raking that into the tree lines. Uh, we just want the trees to be a little more sized up first. And we also right now are kind of using the alleys as uh, pollinators. Like it's, it's a 20 acre, 25 acre prairie. The prairie was kind of nominal to, you know, how could it, how good it could have been, hence why the chestnuts are there not in the other prairie area. Um, but there's like 5,000 stem of milkweed and nine different species of milkweed in this beautiful alleyway. And some of that we're converting into garlic production or other things. Um, but I think there's a lot of value in agroforestry to actually be using that alleyway as ecological good. Right. And then the last question in the chat so far is in regards to food force, what made you choose the crops you chose? What kind of resources did you use to determine what crops go well together? I would like to move forward with something similar. And the only good resources I've found is you guys and Mark Shepard on New Forest Farm. I'll, I'll take a stab and then you have more to say, I know, Chris. So basically, Shabu Jos, former director of the Center for Agroforestry, my research advisor in grad school, uh, he taught a class called Ecological Interactions in Agroforestry Systems. And um, among other things, he said, you know, that yes, there's cooperation via, you know, mycorrhizal fungi passing water and phosphorus to each other. Uh, you know, it's, we don't want to view just the competition as the only or central metaphor for what's going on here, it's sort of a colonizer mindset. But um, it is also true that there is, a, there is uh, and the Savannah Institute has always been hip to this, right? Uh, there, there's got to be a ground layer of vegetation between, we're talking about a savanna archetype, not a closed canopy forest archetype. So, um, you know, in silver pasture design, I think I saw, maybe I saw one of our silver pasture friends on here, but basically, typically people choose uh, trees for silver pasture that have compound leaves. They transmit a lot of light through. So like the black locust or a honey locust or a black walnut. Um, things that grow in partial shade like oaks and chestnuts can grow up under that in the process of ecological succession. And then, you know, finally you get the 
shade tolerant sugar maples or beech or whatever coming in um, in a forest. So you're, we're kind of in the middle, right? Chestnuts do not have compound leaves. They do not transmit light very well through their canopy. So you have to design, if you're growing chestnuts as your primary crop, you have to design around um, crops that are going to do well uh, in the space that you have uh, and in the time that you have when there's light. And so, you know, you can go out, you can take a hint from nature, right? So we're not growing ramps, but uh, ramps, wild leeks, you know, in, uh, in, in the Midwest and in Appalachia, these are uh, spring ephemeral wild vegetables. And you can see they're in the garlic family and they come up in the spring and they disappear. Uh, you know, they, 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 their leaves are totally gone by, you know, basically the third week of May. And uh, garlic is not too dissimilar from that. And what, you know, why, why does, why do ramps come up then? Well, there's no, there's no uh, leaves on the trees. So they, they've got basically got full sun for a couple of months and then, you know, the leave, the trees leaf out. And so garlic is not that dissimilar, right? It's, it, it goes a little bit further, you know, you, you don't harvest it till the beginning of July. But if you plant it in the fall, it starts to grow up a little bit, it goes dormant, it starts growing again in earnest and, you know, beginning of April, uh, or even, you know, mid-March, it's showing signs of life. And, you know, by the time that the uh, chestnuts are putting on their leaves, which is about the beginning of May. Uh, most of them have uh, broke bud. And then, you know, by the third week in May, you know, by, by towards the end of May, um, the things have been growing for, you know, two months in the spring without any interference from the uh, chestnuts. So that's sort of weak competition for light. That's uh, ecological niche partitioning. Um, and uh, we, we picked this up from uh, Bill Stouffer, who's growing winter wheat, which you plant and harvest at the same time in his uh, orchard, which is fairly mature at this point. It's not completely mature, but um, we were really encouraged by his yields of wheat. You know, he started out as a wheat, corn, and soy farmer, and then he planted uh, 20 acres and chestnuts and just kept growing wheat year after year. It's not organic, unfortunately, but um, we decided how can we do that, but how can we make more money uh, using the same, you know, partitioning of the sunlight on the annual calendar? And uh, how could we potentially do this organically? And so we thought, well, what if we, what if we grow, what if we grow into growing the garlic on a third of our acreage and then letting that ground rest for two years before we plant garlic again and have some cover crops in there and just move the garlic, you know, on a three year rotation across the whole orchard system. And if we get that up and going, you know, if we're doing good and if we mechanize it and we make enough money, maybe that can bankroll the installation of future orchards. Uh, so that's how we got into garlic. Um, and, uh, Inflation and the war in Ukraine have definitely increased uh, garlic prices um, in terms of like uh, seed garlic. And so it seems to be a seller's market at the moment. We'll see how it goes, but uh, that's, that's a little bit. I wanna say one more thing, and that is the food forest archetype, right? Where you have, you know, the textbook from Dave Jack and you've got like a hundred different species or maybe 200 species. That's really good. But in terms of like building a business, we have to have each one of these players has to like do the thing that's gonna say, yeah, we can pay, we can pay somebody to help us harvest that because we're gonna be able to sell it. Um, so it's a simplified ecosystem for sure. But um, uh, in terms of like, we've got chestnuts, pawpaw, and garlic underneath with some grass. And maybe we'll get some sheep in there eating the grass at some point. Maybe we'll get some chickens scratching up the, um, to keep the weevils down basically as organic weevil control later in the life of the orchard. But you know, if it stops there and that's just 
six species. That's still a lot better than most. Uh, uh, it would be hard for an annual place, except for crop rotation and like a diverse cover crop mix to beat that kind of biodiversity where every species is doing a thing. All right, I'm spent. <laughs> I'll pick up because um, it's just an interesting thread, I think. Because I think what we're talking about here is design. Um, so I teach uh, permaculture design here in Cincinnati and kind of a couple other places in Ohio. And that's the core part of my practice, same with Badger. And I think a lot of people on this call. Um, so I think there's a lot of resources out there to learn that. But at the end of the day, I do feel the design process kind of gets rebuilt as you, as you practice it each time. So like I said, for this farm, we kind of designed 19 different farms. They all had different variables that we swapped out. Um, so if the question is, uh, I like this template of food forestry, what species, how do I go about the selection process? One of the best recommendations I would have is uh, studying with Dave. I, I got to do Dave's, um, Dave Jackie's forest garden design intensive. And I think I grew a ton through that process. His two volume book teaches a great deal on design. I'm, I have a music background. Like that's where my college degree is. Like design is not a part of my um, milieu until I studied more permaculture. Um, but then I think the, uh, something we learned and I keep hearing reiterated from Greg Miller at Rue 9 Co-op um, cause he gets people asking them questions about chestnut all the time. And people often ask in the context of, I have this land, will chestnuts work here? And he's like, no, you should flip that. <laughs> you should say, I want to grow chestnuts. Now let me find the land that will grow chestnuts. So a lot of this might be, um, understanding the crops that you want to grow that you think has a market that you can understand mm -hmm. some of the nature of the market. And then you find the land that works with that. Um, so, uh, if that's for us, pawpaw and chestnut kind of do share a good Venn diagram of soil pH requirements. And we already knew that we had those, that kind of pH there at the site. Uh, then we are five minutes drive from the Ohio Pawpaw Festival. So we are right around the corner. Uh, so in terms of market, pawpaw started to be a logical conclusion. Like Badger said, we, we could have stopped at chestnut. Like we were, we were happy with that. Um, but because we saw other people doing it because it made sense in our market, because it made sense with the other ecological requirements of growing that crop without kind of forcing it to limp along forever, um, then we knew it was the right choice for us. And over time, you just kind of make these conclusions like garlic makes sense for us. We hope sheep will make sense at some point, but no one lives at the farm. So it's like, it's not a viable option for us right now. And I think this is just what we do naturally as humans, as we find stasis with our beliefs, our values, and our community, is we start to make these choices. And I think people are here in this room because we want to start making a different set of choices culturally and agriculturally. So yeah, I think design science as a practice and a process is, is where you have to kind of sit in uncomfortable spots where you're like, oh, I want I want this interesting, fun thing I just learned about. I want this trinket, I want this plant. Sit, take a moment, take a breath <laughs> um, and ask what the land wants um, and what you want, like you as the designer are a part of the system. You have to read yourself into it because your biases are already coming into the system. Don't pretend that they, that they aren't. Um, that's my piece. Yeah, I, I will say that uh, be very tempting to say, well, let's just, you know, grow some hops or some hardy kiwi as an experiment on some of our trees. And it's like, well, I mean, there's not, we don't know of a single commercial hardy kiwi farm in ohio so do we really think that with our focus split between four crops already that we are going to become hardy kiwi farmers we might play around with that a little bit at some point but um, pretty aggressive crop and don't want to have it be detrimental to our chinese chestnut so uh, but we did want to go beyond you know uh a monoculture of chestnuts. It's not really agroforestry if you're just growing chestnuts. You know, over yielding, stacking multiple crops is uh, necessary um, to uh, you know to get these get these greater yields. Um, thanks, Badger. I think we should wrap things up here. But uh, thanks to both you and Chris for being here and answering questions and telling us about your operation. So. 
If people want to learn more, uh, this webinar will be available on the Savannah Institute YouTube channel. And in the next couple months, we're also going to have uh, videos coming out with all of the um, farms and businesses that have been part of this partnership project. So um, Southern Ohio Chestnut Company will have a video coming out and um, some of the other ones too. We'll have some info sheets coming out that have uh, more of the details about the partnership. So um, thanks again to both of you and thanks for everybody joining us today. So have a good rest of your day. Thank you all. Wonderful sharing space and time with you. Talk again soon, I hope.